Asma Ahmed means Arthur Isaac. Sarah Peach. Jennifer King. It's time to get black, y'all. Who's hot in here? Oh, hot as hell. That's Italianish for what's up, beautiful people. Your boy is back, and this week promises to leave you hungry, happy, and inspired. Three things I'm also aiming for in my upcoming memoir, Eat Craig Love, hitting shelves next year, so please mark your calendars and pick up a copy, or maybe even 10. Craigie needs a new infinity pool for hot back summer 22, and that pool ain't gonna pay for itself. You know what I'm saying? Now, you're probably wondering why in creation I not only have a kitchen in my intermountain estate, but why in creation I have this amazing pizza oven? Well, let me tell you, it's way deeper than crust, sauce, and mozzarella. Our first story is about a group of pizza guys that are not only cooking up delicious pies, but are also rectifying injustice while giving opportunities that otherwise wouldn't have been on the table. Now, uh, it's getting a little hot in here, so I won't say much more other than to sit back, grab a slice, and enjoy our first piece. Your attention, please. Meet Down North Pizza. Whew, who's hot in here? I oh, wish I had like a, a Southern Baptist fan. Family. Oh, oh, that, yo, that's nice. Ooh. Oh, it's hot again. What happened? Hey, wait. I consider myself a serial entrepreneur. I've been involved in different businesses and different industries. But this has been my latest venture and by far the one I hold dearest to my heart. I always respected the art and the industry of cooking. I've always wanted to get into this, to start something, something from scratch. To see it through is a process. It's an experience for me, an experience that we're looking to share with the world. Wow, time. You were supposed to be here at 6.30. What you got to say for yourself? I believe a man shouldn't be defined by his mistakes. I always seen value in people who were formerly incarcerated because their thing is they're just limited on the opportunities, right? And given the opportunity, they will show you the true person because people who have been formerly incarcerated are viewed as defects or throwaways in society, right? But I see the opposite. For me, it was personal. I've been cooking since I was a kid. Family reunions and dinners. When I came home from the mountains, I went to the Art Institute for a bachelor's in culinary management, and I've been cooking ever since. I use 50-pound bags of flour, 
That's the base of everything that I do. And I turn that 50 pound bag of flour into 70 doughs. So when I pull the dough out, I gotta measure 70 times into each pan. I have to cut it, measure it, put it back in the pan, let it proof for about five to 10 minutes. By proofing, I mean the yeast and the sugar marry and gas forms inside of the bread and the gluten networks start to connect. And that's where you get the chewiness in the dough. So I gotta at least proof it one time. Then I press all the air out, let it proof up one more time. And then I'm ready to fire in the oven. What's up, baby? People tend to view individuals who have been formerly incarcerated as defects in society. I never looked at it as a stain on them as a person because I look at the individual. I tend to look past all of that. You know, some of people's upbringing and their socioeconomic status that may have caused them to be a part of the system. So I tend to look at the actual person. So let's meet the person. Can you tell me a bit more about some of the people you have here on the team? Okay, my number two. I call him my number two, Manolo to my Scarface. His name is Mar. He was actually an executive sous chef at another restaurant that I worked at prior. And given the state of the economy, it wasn't too many people that wanted to work. One thing I knew about Mar was that he met all the criteria to work at Down North. And I know for a fact, he could cook his ass off. And then we got my guy D. He just came home from doing 15 years in the feds, 10 years before that in the state. So half of his life, he's been incarcerated. We went on a bowling expedition, like little outings that we do to build team strength and stuff and togetherness. And this is D's first time bowling in damn near 30 years. He grabbed the ball in front of third line, let off, strike. Everybody went crazy because it was just an amazing sight just to see him bowl for the first time in like 30 years, straight strike. He ain't even walked down the lane. He just threw the ball, strike, you know what I mean? Like people were complaining because they lost some of their social skills during COVID. And here's this guy, he just did 25 years, half of his life, man. He just came out and got right to it. Never missed a beat. And Herm, right, he's 50 years old. Never had a job before. Came to us initially, not even looking to stay long-term. However, as he started to work and progress and seen the benefits and the brotherhood that was being built at Down North, his outlook on jobs has changed. Now he's looking to stay with us long-term. It's like that camaraderie, that brotherhood that Mike was talking about. Like, I'm big on that, you know, getting it in in the kitchen. Like, in a way, we can be out enjoying life as well. You know, for me, like building that relationship, that brotherhood, that togetherness, that's going to ultimately keep these people out of these situations because you got to have a support system, a strong support system. We have talks about everything, whether it be, you know, basketball, whether it be life. Whether it be about family issues, this is a place you can come to. And if you're not feeling the best version of yourself today, then come on, let's talk about it. Open up, even if it doesn't feel comfortable. If you're going through something, we'll give you your space. I guess you can call it an untraditional kitchen. This is what Down North is all about. The symbol of Down North and what we're about as we expand this same brotherhood and sisterhood that we're trying to build in these kitchens is stuff we feel is one of the antidotes to a healthy human being. Being able to feel as though you have opportunities and resources to help you through this journey, because it's a marathon. So you have to accept that that time is gone, but we can move forward. This whole thing is about living, right? Our motto is that we just slinging pies and saving lives. So that's what they're doing. And it's like so much of their lives have been taken away. So it's time to live a little, right? You come into the kitchen, you see all the smiles, and a lot of these people had nothing to smile about. They, like you, enjoy being happy. We're all looking forward to working, being around each other, and joking. So that's how we know what we're doing is working. Because it's not a job at that point. We actually look forward to being around each other and working in these dynamics. That's how we know the things that we're doing are definitely working.
Now, that's what I'm talking about. Less sauce, more action. Keep doing your thing out there in Philly, y'all. I'll be through soon enough for more than a few pies. Maybe I can even get one named after me. Maybe like Craig's Mega Crusty or something. Heck, I don't know. So at this point, you're wondering, why am I talking with this accent, and why am I dressed like a rodeo champ? Well, partner, the answer is simpler than polishing hooves on a prize hog doing a deep fried pie eating contest at the state fair on an unusually hot fall night in October. You see, I'm getting my mind focused on the next segment, which you guessed it, is about a black cowboy. I was actually up for a few cowboy roles early in my career, but in the end, I just couldn't handle all the chafing. Just not enough baby powder west of the Mississippi to handle things down yonder. Oh, well, let's leave the cowboy stuff to my buddy right here. I think you're gonna find it real, real good to watch. Y'all's attention, please. Meet Ezekiel Mitchell. Hey! Bang, you dead. There was a garage sale right across the street from my house. Something about it was calling me over there. So I walked over and uh, under the table there was a blue cowboy hat. I picked it up and I bought it for $8. I took it home, reshaped it, molded it, made it my own. That blue hat is a pretty big part of me. It eventually ended up giving me my nickname. Blue. My dad was a cowboy. He didn't always have the means uh, to be a cowboy, but he was a cowboy. He told me uh, that a cowboy should be humble and hard working. Don't half-ass it. When I was a kid, there's a fair park, kind of horse track in my hometown, and uh, my dad would always take me there. I guess that's when my, my fascination with horses uh, began to really grow. I always wanted to be around them. It's unfortunate that the legacy of African-American cowboys and their contributions have been, you know, not only blatantly omitted, but oftentimes whitewashed from the annals of American history. Yet they were there. I didn't come from a traditional rodeo family, but I wanted to learn how to ride bulls and I didn't have anybody to teach me. So what does a kid in our generation do? I, I looked online at videos, uh, for the bull riding basics, and I built myself a, a buck and barrel in my backyard, and I began just trying to do the same moves that they were doing on there. And I ended up going to a school to rodeo uh, when I was 19 years old, and I was placed with the kids in the advanced class because I had already taught myself so much. I think that was probably one of the biggest moments in my career moving forward. I got away from home, away from that sense of safe. And I actually learned that I had to get out there and get it on my own. 2016, I entered the professional ranks in San Antonio, Texas. There, it was a kind of a little grind, but 2019, I had finally achieved my goal. I was at the elite level, riding with all my heroes. there would be a separate rodeo for these black cowboys. These individuals could not participate in mainstream rodeo. They were allowed to possibly perform prior to the start of the rodeo, or what they call slack. Um, some of these stock contractors would not want a black cowboy to ride that animal, because if that individual did ride that animal, the price of that bull goes down. Bull riding definitely isn't for the faint of heart. 
when you're battling an animal that outweighs you by 10 times, definitely takes a special kind of person. It's just you and that beast. It's uh, the most controlled chaos. But it's uh, pretty much poetry in motion. Anything uh, that I've ever done, I wanted to be the best at, and uh, bull riding's no different. I want to be a PBR world champion. Another part of my goals as a bull rider is to bring more diversity and love to the sport that I love so much. There are so many kids across the country that uh, reached out to me and, and talked to me and uh, asked me for help. I'm just excited to be along for the ride and see where they go. The future is bright. Are rodeo cowboys athletes, icons, or entrepreneurs? Having done the research and looking in the literature and interviewing, we came to the realization that they are all of the above. Being a cowboy to me is uh, being humble and uh, taking care of everything that God's put on this earth for us. And more importantly, uh, working hard and, and, and loving hard, you know, just being the best person that you can be. Long day rodeo and cowboy got my hind parts high and tight. Gonna need to set up a little Epsom salt bath to loosen things up and get me right for the. <sighs> okay, let me lose the accent and wrap this one up. Ezekiel, keep doing your thing, my man. And please. Give me any records on heating pads and or padded spandex to avoid me walking like I just sat on a stool of hot coals. It's nice to have this comfortable bedroom to come back to every night. I don't know anything better to unwind with than a good mattress, good drink, good snack, and a good movie from a young black filmmaker. And tonight I've got just the one. From starting as a page at NBC to booking comedy shows and in her own words, fostering diversity in the comedy space through inclusive lineups. She's putting in the work to have faces like ours that miss black people. On screen, making the world laugh at our inside jokes. Well, I'm ready to get into this, so let me slip these boots off and let my dogs breathe. Without further ado, your attention please, a short film by Simone Baptiste. a beetle in my windowsill over the summer. He was there so long I named him. I named him Riley. I call every little cute thing that name. I don't know, I guess it just rolls off the tongue. Riley. Cute and unique, a rare creature whom I loved. His presence felt familiar, like family or something. Cause before I knew it, Riley had made himself at home. Nestled up in the corner of my window, all comfy. It was sweet the first month, but three months in, I started to feel fully taken advantage of. He's a beetle, I get it. Well, he can't open up a little bit, be a little more sociable. Lift one of them 30 arms of his to say, thank you for putting the rent down for the seal. He's taking up residence in. I can't get none of that. His cuteness definitely saved him from getting himself thrown out on his back because he was audacious, arrogant, and bold as hell. The more he stayed, the more I was suspicious about who he was and where he came from. One night, the suspicion consumed me, and I got upset. I remember I had a bag of brownies. 
I bought from the dispensary for emergency purposes only. Since I was suspicious and that was the emergency, I went ahead and I ate all nine. And 30 minutes later, everything began to make sense to me. Riley was a whole ass Martian. I said, you want to abduct me? After all I've done for you, you extraterrestrial mooch. Gracefully, I jumped over the couch mm. to look him in his beady little deceitful eyes. Who are you and where did you come from? Thinking I could intimidate him out of his pointed little out of season boots. You think you better than me because you got hella as I stared deep into his soul, I thought, I should get some more brownies. Then I realized, oh yeah, I murdered those like 30 minutes ago. I remembered I had some wine I stole from a party I wasn't invited to. I saved it in my pantry, you know, in case of an emergency. Since Riley was a zombie, cause I forgot he was an alien, I went ahead and I poured myself a couple glasses of cab everything began to make sense to me. Riley wasn't a zombie or alien, no. He was too still for that. It was like he was planted there. I figured it out. I could slap his phony little unscrupulous face. Did the feds send you? You a tracking device? Huh? You trespassing snitch? After all the times I shared my darkest secrets with you, after all the nights we cried together, you told them about that one time I did, wrong? He ignored me like always. I wanted to take another sip of wine, but I had emptied two bottles without even noticing. I remember I had some moonshine in a silk bag underneath my bed, uh, contingent upon if something happened. Since I ran out of wine, and that was the what happened, I sprinted upstairs to take a few shots Walked back down, then limped my way over to the window. And oh my God, a Riley had moved! For the first time in three months, he was crawling away from the seal. I could tell he was mad about the whole me thinking he was an informant thing. I just knew he was planning to get me back for that. I panicked. I ran into the bathroom for a weapon. I don't know what his weapon of choice was. But I was about to introduce him to a lethal bottle of nail polish. Oh, yeah. I said, I'm about to color you purple now. I could tell he was frightened after I threatened him. I admitted the possibility of being wrong. I put the nail polish away and sat down calmly to express myself. Well, if it's not the cops who sent you, Riley, somebody had to send you. I was concerned, and the wine I had earlier was making me sleepy. I needed some energy. I remembered I had a flask of tequila mixed with an energy drink I left in an unkempt wig I wore to get out of jury duty last fall. I left it taped to the middle, secured by the lace part, to prepare myself for any future crisis. Since Riley was lying, and that was the crisis, to the head, briefly blacked out, then knew exactly where that little seal-stealing scrounge came from. Oh, so my mama sent you? Huh? You told her I'm still talking to that dude who tripped me at the store to get my number three months ago? Riley began to crawl towards the window, aiming for the hole in the screen. I said, why are you going towards the hole in the screen? You abandoning me now? You abandoning me? I swear, you just like your daddy. Can't take a little confrontation for you have to get the hell on up out of here. Well, go ahead and go then. I don't know who sent you. I don't know who sent you, but I'm not offended by you being here. I mean, you can stay. I mean, you can be anybody. Maybe you're an angel. <gasps> Did God send you? <laughs> Okay, 
Okay, okay. Whew, sorry. Oh, let me gather myself. Okay. Whew. We good, we good, we good. I know it was gonna be funny, but that was like funny, funny. If you know the difference, then you know the difference. Keep making us laugh, Simone, and please be on the lookout for a part for me, Craig Robinson, really, really, really gifted comedian actor in your next film. I do know a thing or two about these jokes. No. Well, that's all the time we have for this week. I'm probably gonna lay it down pretty soon. Between the horseback riding and busted gut from laughing, I need some time to physically recover from these hosting ailments. But don't let my issues stop y'all from chasing. As always, don't forget to find what you love, share it with the world, and scream from the mountaintop. Your attention, please! please.